So you ended up getting into camming. And then how did you do in that world? Like how, after the initial, you know, first part, which you said was a little bit scary, um, did you find that you enjoyed camming after that? And how frequently were you doing it? Yeah. I mean, like you have to understand for the context at this point, my expectation for my own life was incredibly low. I had been raised to expect to be a housewife to a, like a lower class guy. Um, and then when I lost my faith, I was like, maybe the best I can get is like a couple promotions at a gas station manager type deal. Like that was like the peak of what I thought I was capable of, but like I hadn't conceived that I could do anything else uh, because like college was not an option for me due to finances. Um, so when I started camming and I made $60 the first night in a couple hours of work, I was, this was like a life-changing amount for me. I was like, holy shit, a whole new world is possible. And it was like so exciting for me that like I had like some sort of like very direct control over my ability to earn money um, that it just, it, I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I was camming as much as I could. I was having an incredible time with it. I tried a bunch of creative stuff. I, this is where I learned to mime. It's one night there was some mime face paint lying around because it was October and I dressed up as a mime and then did a show and they loved it. So I just kept doing it. And then I eventually accidentally got like pretty good as a, a sex mime specifically, like really good at making fake dil- dicks and whatever. Um, so it was really wonderful. <laughs> that <is a> unique <laughs> talent. I love that. Oh my God. Um, and I was, I wasn't making that much, maybe like 80 to a hundred dollars an hour, which I mean, for me, that was like, spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I say not much now compared to how much I make now. <laughs> right. Um, and I did really well after I went to Sophia Locke's cam mansion, which is a mansion that I don't know if you know Sophia Locke, but she was a cam girl doing very, pretty well on the website, My Free Cams specifically. And then she hosted a mansion where a bunch of the girls came and lived in this mansion for like a week or so and filmed a bunch of content together. And it was like a publicity stunt. So I went and with all of these other girls and really good connections. They're really fantastic. And after that, my income hit around $200 an hour on average and maintained there for about five years. Wow. So what made you decide to make the switch to OnlyFans? And was it maybe like, uh, cause I, I remember when OnlyFans came along, I was like, Oh, I'll get my URL just cause so no one yeah. else takes it. But then I didn't take it seriously at all for years. Like I barely paid any attention to it. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like everyone was on OnlyFans and then I decided to really try it. And that changed a lot. So that was that kind of the same thing for you? Like yeah. you got on it and you're like, this is a side thing. And then, so what made you decide to like really throw yourself into it? Yeah. Like you, I signed up early on uh, 2017 and like nobody was really using it. And I made like, I don't know, $50. And I was like, I guess that's, it's not really worth my effort. But around that time I was getting burned out of camming. Um, and so a friend offered me a data analyst position at a crypto startup. So I joined that. Um, turns out it's not great. I don't like working a normal job for other people doing things that I, I personally don't care about. Uh, and also I wasn't making a ton of money. So um, at the end, 2018, at the end of 2018, I started doing physical in-person escorting because um, I was really burned out of camming. Uh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was very fun in the beginning, but you know, it gets kind of old. You have the same clients and you have to continually produce new material, like very intensive. Um, so I was doing in-person sex work, which was really great. And I really liked it. And I did that for about a year and a half till COVID hit. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't want to kill my clients because uh, a lot of them are older. Uh, and also a lot of them just like don't want to see me because of COVID risk. So um, and that was right around the time OnlyFans was blowing up. So my friends were like, get on OnlyFans, decided to get on OnlyFans. And then within three months, I was making $100,000 a month. It's amazing. So before we dive into that, because I know that you're like the resident expert on OnlyFans, um, I just want to talk about the escorting really quickly because, you know, that's something a lot of, lot of sex workers do. A lot of people in the adult industry do performers, but a lot of people don't want to talk about it. But I mm-hmm. f- have found that more people are being more and more open to, to talking about it. You know, it's been considered such a taboo thing for so long, but you're super open about it. So tell us a little bit about like Maybe what were your clients like in general? Yeah. Uh, well, it, clients are dependent a lot on pricing. When I first started, I charged 800 an hour and then it gradually cre- increased it to 100, and, uh, sorry, 1200. And it, that's like, it seems like a small change in like the higher end, but even there, there was a difference in clientele versus the price. Um, so I'm not representative of the general population. I think the median in larger cities is like $500 or something an hour. 
Um, but mm -hmm. for me, they tended to be uh, higher end guys, um, lawyers, doctors, uh, successful writers, uh, TV show writer <laughs> people, <laughs> um, architects, uh, sort of like the kind that had the, a, a disposable income that allowed them to see me. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, average age um, 45. I, I tracked most of the data in a spreadsheet. Um, so you you did a spreadsheet of your clients and you like did a data. I, I yeah, love how, like, I, I you tracked data um, like the sex positions we had, their occupation, how attractive I found them and how good I thought they were at sex, who orgasmed, how many times, um, how many times I saw them, how long the appointment was, the city it was in, stuff like that. Wow. You are a different kind of woman. That's amazing. So wait, did you reach any conclusions with all of this statistical data? <laughs> So unfortunately, I only started tracking like a, a part of the way through. So I have about 75 data points for, from 75 mm -hmm. appointments. Um, it's just like mm -hmm. good, but not enough to draw like very strong conclusions unless you have like a really strong correlation. Um, right. So uh, I did find a, a weak suggestion that I tend to orgasm more with unattractive clients, which is interesting. Um, and there's a lot of data, like, you know, how the frequency of sex positions. But I think that this is probably confounded by me as a person, like, depending on, like, what positions I, I sort of guided them to. So Right. Why do you think that you orgasm more with unattractive clients? Was it because they, they tried harder? Yeah, I think so. Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I got a really attractive client, I was like, damn it. <laughs> All right, guys, you heard it straight from Ella's mouth. Okay. <laughs> like you don't have to be hot to be a good lover. You've just like increased the confidence of so many guys watching this like tenfold. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, and then, uh, what do you think people's biggest misconception about, um, that line of work is because there's, you know, there's a lot of stigma around that. I think even more so than performing, you know, in, in media. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stigmas and like some of it is like kind of true. Like most stereotypes are based to some degree on accuracy. Um, but I think that sort of is very grainy and misses a lot of very important nuance. Um, so for me, again, higher end. Um, but like I found that the majority of the clients, I would say 80 percent seem to genuinely care about my experience and my well-being. I'd say like roughly 20 percent seem to just sort of be like I felt very interchangeable for 20 percent of them. Like I could have been mm -hmm. any other body. They just want to like slam it, be done and, and sort of leave. Uh, and they were like, obviously, mm -hmm. like, I'm paying for you. I expect to have a good experience. I'm going to sort of use you, um, which was like fine. It's, a, like, it's an exchange that I'm voluntarily making. And I like, prefer having that exchange than not having it. Um, but probably 80 percent of them seemed to like actually really care about me. And that was really cool. And I feel like like most people sort of think about sex work is, and like the clients don't give a shit about the prostitute. Mm -hmm. um, and this is absolutely not the case. Like men, like I didn't expect the degree that which like men really feel the need for some sort of emotional intimacy to be able to get satisfaction from the sex itself. It was really cool. That's amazing. Wow. And, and well, how long was your average appointment? Uh, I think like how many hours? 1.5 hours, I think was the average, maybe two. And so this kind of points to like an interesting fact about escorting. And I was talking about this with another guest recently was that you, the sex, so how long did the sex generally last? Like the sex itself? You know, I didn't track that, but like based on my memory, uh, I would say maybe 20 to 30 minutes. So that means that like, there's a good hour maybe where you guys aren't having sex. So what are you doing in that, in that time period? Talking usually. Um, yeah. sometimes we'd go to dinner beforehand the talk mm -hmm. a, a lot of guys liked it and i also really preferred it when it was like set up like a date like i get to know the guy a bit beforehand um mm -hmm. and then i just kind of feel like a slut like the slut who like goes to dinner and then it's like i don't know i guess i'll fuck this guy it's just like i'm a little encouraged <laughs> so it's pretty much just me in college except i wasn't getting paid for it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. You know, I've talked to a lot of other girls who've done full service sex work and, and almost all of them had said, yeah, the majority of the time is spent talking. And a lot of these guys just want like a connection with somebody, but they don't necessarily have time for a girlfriend or mm -hmm. really the desire to have a girlfriend. They might travel a lot. And for them, it's like, you know, an, an opportunity to experience an evening with a beautiful woman, you know, get what, you know, pretty much most guys are after when they go on a date with you. And, um, you know, no strings attached. Don't have to worry about 
you know, if they have to call her the next day and if she expects a relationship or something like that. So I don't know. I've always felt that like escorting makes so much sense to me. Um, and you know, I wish more people were kind of more understanding and open to that line yeah. of work. Cause I think it's, I think you guys honestly provide like a service to people. Yeah. Out of the three, um, forms of sex work that I've done so far, escorting felt to me to be the healthiest, both to me and the guys that I saw. It felt to be like the mm. most humanizing and the most intimate. And like, I, it felt like I was doing actually the most good for someone. I, I it's right. strange to me that like escorting is so legally uh, suppressed compared to the others. Um, Cause like when people are so concerned about like the adverse effects, like what is this doing psychologically to our men and women? I'm like, well, if you like, I feel like the in-person stuff is the least likely to, to cause those adverse effects. So I wish that was more legalized or decriminalized rather. Really? It's, so that's interesting. So why do you think that, do you think because that human connection like kind of bypasses, I don't know. Yeah. Explain to me, like, how, how do you mean by that? Yeah, it's it's more organic or something. It's uh, if I had to pull on an argument that like maybe might be used to justify other things I don't agree with, it would be um, uh, it's like the, the oldest. It's like very old. It's a uh, very traditional. We haven't it hasn't been modified by technology. Um, like OnlyFans is something. It's like an abnormal type of experience that could only be caused in twenty twenty one ish. Um, and it's very asymmetric. You have like a lot of men viewing one woman and the men are separated from each other. Like there's no way that this could, this is like playing on psychology in like really novel ways. And we don't know the impacts of that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. Like we have to, we have to go with tech. Uh, we have to roll with the punches, not against them. Um, but, but if we're going for like optimizing for psychological health, I would say that, uh, seems like the older, more sustainable thing probably feels better. 